Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Merry Christmas. Thought today maybe we would take a trip through Isaiah. Specifically, a passage about the coming Messiah. Let's take a look, shall we? I'm going to put my normal voice on now. Okay, so Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 is a very intriguing passage to me this year. You know, the Holy Spirit has ways of making things pop sometimes that, like, you didn't notice before. And this passage just pops to me this year. It's one that we've heard a hundred times. In fact, the Boltons just read it a few minutes ago here on this service. But let's let's take a look at it again. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, we've talked about this before, but there is a being in the Old Testament that, in my opinion, and the opinion of theologians and scholars, many of them, is this isn't just like some hocus pocus, like crazy Christianity type thing that's just been thrown around. This is actually taken seriously on many levels. Um, in the Old Testament, there seems to be a Jesus figure who seems to be Jesus himself. He is known as the angel of the Lord. Now, we've talked about him before. If you want to learn more, just let us know, and I'll get you in contact with the right episodes or um, the messages that we've preached in the past. But more or less, when this angel shows up in the Old Testament, he acts like he is God and that he's not God, like all at the same time, similar to how Jesus acts, as though he is separate but the same. Uh, when the angel shows up, he speaks on behalf of God, and then he's asked a question, and he answers as though he is God. And this is pretty commonplace with this angel. He's just constantly um, doing things that blur the lines between, between him and God. Now, there's an interesting passage uh, with Jacob in Genesis, and Jacob wrestles with a man that is God. God, <laughs> right? Like, that's weird. We don't know what to do with that, but it makes sense once we understand that there is this kind of manifestation of God known as the angel of the Lord that appears throughout the Old Testament. So it appears that the angel of the Lord wrestles with Jacob, and after they've wrestled for a bit, Jacob asks, like, what's your name? And this man slash God responds, why do you want to know my name? And we're left in suspense, like, what is the angel's name? So, some or this man or this this God? What is his name? Why why would we cut it off there? What a cliffhanger, right? Then we fast forward and we get to the story of Samson. Though right before Samson, Samson's parents run into the angel of the Lord, and they ask him his name, and he responds that it's too wonderful. And we're left again on another cliffhanger. Like, why won't anyone tell us what this angel's name is, right? Now, the word wonderful is used throughout the Bible to describe the things that God does. It's used uh, to describe his counseling by Isaiah. But here in today's passage, this traditional Christmas passage that we're all very used to and have heard many times, here in this passage, it's used as a name... For this child who is going to be born one day, on whom the world will rest with him as a king. And since we're used to this word wonderful being used both to describe God and his ways, but also we have this connection to 
this angel of the Lord who is but isn't God, we start to put the pieces together and we wonder, wait a minute, is Isaiah using the word wonderful to reference that angel? Because whoever this this being is that's about to be born, whoever this this savior, this this person who is going to save them from exile and whom the government will rest upon his shoulders, whoever this person is, Isaiah is using crazy language for them. Like to the point that I would wonder if I was if I was alive when Isaiah had prophesied this, would I think that Isaiah is a heretic? <laughs> I mean, come on, use you, you look at the words that he just said. Wonderful counselor. And if that word wonderful is gonna make me think of think of God at all, like I'm thinking, okay, so he's it's gonna be pretty great, I guess. But then Isaiah calls him mighty God. You called a human being mighty God? Like we would we would be outraged if anyone did that today. So maybe, maybe if they don't think that he's heretical, they're at least thinking like, okay, pushing your poetry a little too far here, buddy. You know, hyper, your your hyperbole is a, a little, a little intense today, don't you think? Let's bring it down. You don't want to call a human being mighty God. Let's let's be careful there. But then he's still not done. He goes on to call him everlasting father. Now, everlasting, like, maybe we're just using more hyperbole, or maybe we're referring to someone who is immortal? Like, what, what do we do with that? And then, and then he, he wraps it up with one more phrase, calling him a prince of peace, right? Prince of peace, which never really struck me as much except for like passages like Daniel 10. Like, yeah, Jesus will bring us peace or this son who's going to be born will finally bring peace to the world. That's great. But prince, that's another divinity term that is sometimes used in the Bible of spiritual beings with power. Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, Michael the archangel, who's a, a prince for Israel. Like those those are the phrases that Daniel uses to describe spiritual beings. So, Isaiah comes along and he says that there is a son coming. Which, by the way, is that another word for a spiritual being in which he's using it? Because, you know, it's interesting the way it stands out to us. For to us, a son is born. To us, a son is given. And that, that, that stands out in a very intriguing way to me. And it causes me to wonder just a little bit as to what he's meaning to say there. For uh, for to us, a child is born. So a human being is born among us. That's great. But then to us, a son is given. What does that mean? Is, is that to say that God is giving us one, like his son? Because throughout the Old Testament, when we think of a son of God, that is another term for spiritual beings. So if it's saying to us, a son of God will be given, then there seems to be the possibility of an implication here that God is giving us his son or a son of God or a spiritual being. But not just any given angel or spiritual being, the spiritual being who is but isn't him, the wonderful counselor, the one who said, my name is too wonderful, the, the, the mighty God, the one angel who could correlate with who God is, the prince of peace, the being who could be considered a prince because of his spiritual implications, the everlasting father, who's a father? Well, the Father's God. So is he like God? Yeah, and he's everlasting, well, immortal? Like, like, these terms are huge. And for us, we know who Jesus is. Like, if you've been in the church for a long time, then you know the story of Jesus. And, and it doesn't shock you to read passages like this, these classic passages that say that, you know, here's the prophetic words about Jesus. But imagine being in Isaiah's time. And hearing that a human being would be all of these things and stopping and saying that that 
doesn't even sound human. That sounds like something beyond human. Now, if that sounds like I'm just like fishing here, like J Man, you're just you've been studying too much of this stuff. You've just gone crazy. Here's kind of like the the big thing that catches your attention on this one. When Israel was in exile, closer to the time that Jesus came around, people learned Greek because they lived among the Greeks and they needed to to study things in Greek. So they, they learned the language of Greek. So rather than reading Hebrew anymore, they needed to learn their Bible in Greek because Greek was more the common language, more the standard, right? So, just like we translate our Bibles from Hebrew or Greek into English so that we can read them today, during Jesus' time, they took the Old Testament and translated it from Hebrew to Greek so everyone could read it today. So, in the same way that, like, NIV is a very common translation that many people use, uh, that would have been kind of similar to to the time of Jesus. They had the Septuagint. It was like the NIV of their time. Everybody read this one translation. It was like the only one they really had. So when these Hebrews, these Jews of Jesus' time are translating Isaiah 9-6 into their own NIV of sorts, into their own Greek translation, what do they call this, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this this everlasting father, this prince of peace. If they were to translate that into Greek, what would they say? It's interesting. None of those words appear. So let's read it in their version, their Septuagint, their NIV, their translation, okay? Here's how they would say those four terms. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. They would condense that all into these few words. Messenger of the Great Council. Which <laughs> should confuse us at first, right? Like, messenger of the Great... That that wasn't used at all. Like, messenger. The word messenger in Greek is, is angelos, which is angel. Because that's what angels are. They're messengers. And here in this passage, we have... This wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting father, this son who's given to us, all of that is just kind of like set aside and just called the messenger, the angel of the great council. And this is another topic we talked about it before, but if you live, sorry, if you are a, a heavenly being, then you are a part of God's great counsel. The divine counsel is what it's called in the Bible. And here, when they're making their own version in Greek, they just throw out the words that they should have used. Instead, they say, the angel of the great counsel, the messenger of the great counsel, which leads you to believe we're talking about the messenger, the angel the angel of the Lord, because they've already picked up on these clues of wonderful counselor, that angel whose name's too wonderful, the mighty God, that, that angel who is but isn't God, that everlasting father. And they take all those words together, this prince of peace, and they just point blank say, the messenger of the great council, the angel of the divine council, which would probably be another way of really just saying that straight. And so this was in on the minds of, of those who studied the word. They seem to have this possible expectation by the prophetic word of Isaiah that the angel of the Lord who is but isn't God would come come and save us and then enters jesus this man who isn't just man he's 100 percent man 100 percent god he shows up and he saves us 
saves us from our sin, saves us from uh, our, our dying bodies. He offers us eternal life. He offers us resurrection. He offers us forgiveness and grace and mercy and fruit and character and teaching and wisdom and authority. And uh, this world right now might be dealing with lots of corruption, not only among human leaders, but among spiritual leaders. But here the Bible shows us like the, the one on whom everything should rest that is going to happen by the end of all things the government will rest upon his shoulders and so along comes jesus this wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace and we don't live in just a time where we're waiting for him to come we live in the time where he has already come already won and now we just wait for the fullness of that to come when he restores all things. So this Christmas, rest in the peace of that prince. Rest in, in the, the strength of the one who loves you, who cares for you. And in the midst of the difficulties of a year like 2020, he knows your pain. Because this man who is God put on human flesh and endured everything we went through. So you're not alone. Whatever you've lost this year, whether it be to COVID, to work, to something else, God is willing to put on flesh to feel that same pain that you do. He's willing to, to put himself through uh, the kinds of things that we've been through and more so that we can't say that he doesn't understand. He does. He has been there and he's been tempted in every way that we have. And so we trust in the only one who can make things right. The one who Isaiah prophesied about, the one whom uh, uh, the, the Hebrews and the Jews awaited, and the one whom we've already received and will receive again. And the beauty of Christmas is that we get to remember that these prophecies came true and rest in all that. So with that, Merry Christmas to you. Did that look cool or was that just stupid? It's probably stupid and it's just chocolate milk. And it's kind of a child's drink. Forget it.